Amen. You may be seated. Christ alone. Cornerstone. Amen. I, I played that because that's, I think that was Graceland's favorite song. Well, one of them for sure. Yeah. When I asked, man, let me play that song. But that's a good song. It's one of my favorite songs. Amen. For the Lord, he, he should be the cornerstone. Well, He is the cornerstone. Amen. Just like we talked about this morning, that little scripture uh, that we shared where Jesus, He told the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they rejected the chief cornerstone. Amen. The chief cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone. Amen. That's what He is. There's a, there's a particular passage in here uh, of this song. It says, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, Amen. Most of my my life growing up, I, I built a persona of trying to be tough, Amen. Of trying to be a uh, trying to be a tough guy, Amen. That's that's what I wanted to be. That's what I, I tried to be, and and I thought that was pretty important. And still, we most times, what's that? We were. Yeah, Amen. We were, Amen. We were tough, Amen. But but in all reality, the weakness that's being talked about here. Is, is, is a weakness that's on the inside. Amen. You see, because you can put on a persona of being this tough guy. Oh, you want to be like Scotty said we was. Amen. We, we try to be a little bit. But there was a weakness on the inside. Amen. That I hid. A, a weakness and a, a frailty of, of I, I guess the truth of the matter is of self-control. The inability to control myself in certain areas of my life, amen, and, and certain things that, that really became a bondage in my life, amen, and, and it was not until I really realized of how weak that I really was, amen, when, when, when it comes to a point to where you just can't leave something alone, you just can't get enough of it, and you just can't, you can't stop, amen, and you realize, one day you realize that, man, this thing's got a hold of me. I don't control this thing. It's, it, it controls me now. I, I, I do. When it tells me that this is what you want, it's what I go after. Regardless of, of who I heard in the, in the process. Amen. And I was, we was talking outside this morning, and this wasn't even part of my message, but if you want to be going to the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. But we were talking outside this morning after church, myself and... Jonah and Robert and, and and Robert made the statement that whenever he was on drugs, you know, he really didn't think about the consequences uh, of his actions. He didn't really care about the consequences of his actions. He just did what he thought he needed to do to get what he needed to get or what he felt like he needed to get. Amen. And that's a result of a bondage taking over a person's life, uh, uh, taking control over a person's life. And the world calls it a, an addiction. But the Bible calls it a bondage. Yes. The Bible calls it sin. It, it, the Bible calls it the power of sin. Amen. And what it's important to understand that each and every one of us were born into this world under the power of sin. Amen. The Word of God says that, that a child's just a few days. Amen. And, and he's troubled. He's troubled. Amen. We're all born in, into this world with a thing on the inside of us called sin. It's the power of sin. It was passed down from our father Adam. Amen. In the garden some several thousand years ago. It was passed down from generation to generation to generation. And it's why we are in the shape that we're in. Amen. It's why we find ourselves in the bondages that we're in. It's why, it's why we find ourselves sometimes being out of control. Amen. And let me just go ahead and be honest with you. And this might sound foolish. But the truth of the matter is, and what I've come to understand, that, that you're better off, and it kind of goes along with what I said at the beginning, you're better off finding yourself spiraling out of control, bound by drugs and alcohol and destroying yourself, if it'll show you your need for a Savior, than you are just being a good person all your life and never knowing that you need to be saved. Do you understand that? Do you, under, do you understand what I'm saying? Because everybody needs to be saved. The question is, have you realized that yet? 
The question is, have you come to a place in and of yourself that you realize you're weak and you need someone to make you strong? That Jack Daniels can't make you strong or Corona or Heineken or, or Budweiser or whatever it is that you're drinking on can't make you strong. That Oxycontin, when you snorted it, it can't make you strong. I know, it'll make you strong for a couple of hours, but sooner or later, you're going to need it again. And the truth of the matter, it's not you that's strong, but it's the substance that you're putting in you. And before long, the substance becomes a bondage. You can't function without it. I know, I've seen it. I watched good men destroy their families over those, those 80s. Good men destroy their lives over those pills. Run, run through hundreds of thousands of dollars in a matter of a few months because they're in bondage and what used to feel good now they can't function without it can't function without it it's the bondage of sin but I'm here to say that you're better off going down that path and meeting your Savior than you are to never meet Him at all I'm not justifying any of those things I'm not justifying doing any of those things but I'm here to tell you that people need to be saved that you and I, we needed to be saved. And if you're here today and you've never been born again, I'm not talking about being sprinkled with water or doing a confirmation or something like that because those things don't save you. Coming to church today didn't save you. It's not going to save you, do you? Hear what I'm saying. Saying a, a little prayer every now and then is not going to save you. Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Until you come to a place in your life that you realize that you're lost, you're a sinner and you're separated from God and in and of yourself you're undone and there's nothing that you can do to make it to Him. Until you come to that place to where you realize that, you cannot get saved. You can't get saved. Because the only way one can get saved is that they realize they need to be saved from something. And Jesus, the angel, said, they shall call, you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. He came to save sinners. <laughs> he came to save me and you, John. Amen. He came to save sinners. That's what He came to say. Amen. He's a good God. He loves the lost, amen. He loves the sinner so much that he would shed his blood, amen. He loves you today. I don't care what you've done, how far you think you've fallen or where you found yourself, amen. He, he loves you and he wants to set you free. And not only does he want to, he can. Amen. He can set you free. Amen. I want to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And I really didn't prepare anything I, I just really wanted to talk about something tonight Hebrews chapter 4 and we'll start reading in verse 14 and I want to preach a, a message tonight entitled being bold in your time of need and can I say something real quick that goes right along with what I'm saying um, and it's in reference to this message tonight that this Christianity true biblical Christianity is a relationship of neediness. It's a relationship of neediness. It's you ever realizing that you're needy and that your Savior wants to provide for you. Amen. He wants to provide for you. He wants to do a work in you. Amen. He wants to do a work through you. He wants to set you free today. It's what He died for. Amen. Verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. I want you to understand today that if you're a born again Christian, if you've been born again, if you've been washed in the blood, amen, if the Spirit of God has entered into your heart and He's regenerated you like the Bible says that He must do, amen, then you can come boldly 
to the throne of grace. Amen. For that's what it is for you today. It's a throne of grace. Amen. It's, it's a, a throne of grace to help you in your time of need. And, and as a matter of fact, the writer here, he, he says to, to come boldly. And that word boldly, I looked it up in the Greek earlier, the meaning of it, it means to come openly. It means to come openly, not hiding anything. Amen. Not trying to hide anything from the Lord, but bringing it before Him, but also bringing it before Him and that you can rest assured, you can be sure that He's got just what you need. It's important that we as Christians today, we understand just what, what grace is, amen, and, and what grace is not, because grace has, has gotten, a, unfortunately, it's gotten a, a bad name. It, it's, not, it's little understood in the church today. Uh, grace, uh, I, I heard someone equate it to, to one time a, a Britney Spears song. Grace is not just, oops, I did it again, it's okay. That's, that's not what grace is. It really isn't. And, and that's how we look at it a lot of times. Well, well I've, I've got God's grace and it's, it's all good. But grace is so much more than that. The, the strongest concordance says that grace, it is a divine influence upon your heart. Yes. And it's reflection in your life. Amen. That's why, look, I love to see people come to the altar and, and say the sinner's prayer and profess that they, they gave their heart to Jesus. But even more than that, I love to see grace have an effect on the heart and life of a person because you can say you're saved or you've been saved all you want, but until I see something, until I see grace having its perfect work in your heart and in your life as far as I'm concerned, it's just talk. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that because the Bible says that if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation, Ross. Yes, yes, yes. Old things are passed away. That's right. And all things are become new. When I got saved, Jonah, the things I did yesterday, for some reason, I didn't really care for them too much anymore. That's right. when, when Jesus came into my heart and He changed me, the way I used to treat people yesterday, for some reason, I, I didn't feel right about treating them like that anymore. The way I used to look at people just a few minutes before, I just looked at them differently now. Not because I did something all high and mighty. Not because I took communion or came to church or any of that, but because with a broken heart. I realized that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And that day, Jesus Christ, He came in. The Lord of glory, amen, the Creator of all things. He came to dwell in my heart. And He filled my heart with His grace. And His grace changed me. Now let, let, me, let me say something real quick. because Oh, I need a lot more grace. Oh, I, I need to be changed a lot more than what He's changed me. I've, I've got a whole lot of change in, that needs to be done. And there's, there's so many times still that I often see my weakness. And I, and I cry out just like I, I cry out. Some of my best times of prayer is about 15 minutes before we have service when I'm all alone and I, and I put on a little song. And the, the Holy Spirit, He just convicts my heart of all my weaknesses and, and failures and, and frailties. And, and I can't help but, but cry out and say, Lord, just save me one more time, Lord. Just save me one more time, Lord. I need to be saved. Because I'm weak. And I see these failures in my heart and in my life constantly. On a constant basis. I, I deal with the things in me that need to be affected and changed by the grace of God. And I, and I, I don't want to be tomorrow what I am today. I don't want to be tomorrow what I am today in this Christianity. I want to be ever being changed because that's the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life is to ever be changing that person. And you can go ahead and be prepared with the fact that you'll never be perfect. Not on this side of heaven. I know people in the world, they look at Christians and they call them hypocrites and they say this and, and that and they're a Christian and they're, they're acting like that and this and I understand that. It's just it's something that we have to deal with because the truth of the matter is we're not much different from them. The only difference is we're on the other side of Calvary. 
We've accepted that. What they're saying about us is true. We've seen that. And we've brought it to Calvary. I'm, I'm far from perfect. And I need the grace of God. And, and, and like I said a minute ago, we've got to understand that this Christianity is a relationship with the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ based on neediness. Amen. It's not a relationship to where that, like a parent and a child, as a child grows, they grow more and more distant from needing their parents. But in this Christianity, what happens with you and I, as we grow and mature, we should ever be growing to know more and more that we need Him more today than we've ever needed Him. Do you understand that? As a Christian, you should never be growing to the place that you think you need the Lord less. You should be growing to a place that you realize you need Him more and more. And I, I want to tell you today that, that He wants to give you grace today. He wants to fill your heart with His grace. He wants to change you. He wants to set you free today. Amen. If you have a bondage in your life, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it is, sexual desires, fornication, adulteries, whatever it may be. Bondages come in all shapes and fashions. They come in all different things. Amen. They, they can control your every, your every waking minute. They can control your mind and your heart and, and drive you in your everyday living. They can drive you and control you. But I want to tell you that the Lord, He can set you free by His grace. He can set you free by His grace. That's the only way He works. Amen. It's by grace you are saved through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You've got to understand today that there's nothing. There's nothing you can do to earn God's grace. There's nothing you can do to earn His mercy, His forgiveness. I, I'm sorry, but 30 Hail Marys have done no good for you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it does no good. It's, it's, it's never done anyone any good. Taking communion has never saved anybody. Taking communion has never saved one soul. Putting money in the offering plate has never saved one soul. But the precious blood of Jesus has saved millions throughout the years. The precious blood of Jesus has changed millions of lives throughout the ages. Amen. He's changed millions and millions upon millions of men who were going one direction. And the next day they were going another. And I look upon my life and the direction I was headed before the Lord found me. And it's nothing short of a miracle, Jonah. Do you realize that this salvation is nothing short of a miracle? There's no greater miracle than that one day a man is, is heading one direction, destroying his life, destroying his family, destroying everything that he touches. And then in, the, in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that his whole life is changed and he's no longer going that direction. Do you realize today that that's a miracle? It's a miracle. And He's still performing miracles. He's still saving souls. He's still setting people free. And I want you to understand today that if you have a need, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. In your time of need, you can come. And the Lord, He'll surely give you grace to help you in your time of need. Now, I want you to understand but as a Christian, when you're walking this walk, if you're going to walk this walk any amount of time, you'll find that there's failures along the way. There will be failures. You're going to fail the Lord miserably. I want you to understand that. I've failed the Lord miserably countless times today. Hey Amen. I'm just talking about today. And that's the reality of the situation. But I know because the Word of God tells me that I can still come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in my time of need. And the biggest help that I've found myself needing, and I want you to remember this, Crystal, the biggest help that I find myself needing at times is continually fighting the fight of faith when I've failed him most so miserably. Continuing to hold on and believe that I'm, I'm still saved. That His blood is still enough even when... I've come out looking like a fool. Even when I've acted so foolish 
and, I, and I've given people a reason to mock this Christianity. But His grace is still sufficient to keep you in your time of need. Amen? And oftentimes, what you'll find in this Christian walk is that some of those times where you find yourself being more foolish than what you ever thought you would be. And I believe Ross and I was talking about this yesterday. Some of the things that we did as younger Christians. When I look back and, and think about it. Sometimes I just have to put my head down. And, and shake my head and say, oh my God. What was I thinking? Why would I act that way? Why would I, would I talk that way? But what I'm coming to understand is that it's all part of this process of learning to grow and learning to, to depend upon the Lord, amen, and, and learning to shut up sometimes before you speak. Learning to be patient and waiting upon the Lord and, and, and learning to trust in the Lord. Learning to realize that if He don't do something in me, nothing will ever get done. You see, what I've realized in my heart and in my life is there's, there's some things deep down on the inside of me that I don't understand why they're there. I don't understand exactly how they continue to be there. I don't understand exactly why I can't seem to just get past those things. But I do know and I do believe that the Lord, He's going to have His perfect work in those things and I and I and I realize I've come to the place that I realize that if he don't change those things about me that I'm 100% incapable of changing them myself there's some things I can control but I've got to be honest with you there's a lot of things about me that if the Lord does not reach into my heart by his spirit and change them himself I just don't know if I'll make it but this word right here tells me that I can come boldly. Jonah, you can come boldly. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. Son, I want you to remember as, as you're growing and you're getting a little older and you're going to start experiencing things in life that you can come boldly in your time of need. Amen. The Lord, He, he wants to do a perfect work in our hearts and in our lives. And He died so that He could have access to do that. He died, amen, not so that He could send you to hell, but no, so that He could save you, so that He can change you, so that he could, he could set you free, amen. Unfortunately, the Lord, He's often been painted as a big guy with a stick up there just waiting to knock you out. But that's not the reality of the matter, amen. He shed His blood to set the captive free, amen. He shed His blood to set the sinner free. He shed His blood to, to set the prostitute free of her sins, amen. He shed His blood to set the crackhead free, to set the alcoholic free. He, he shed His blood to set the homosexual free. He wants to change people's hearts. He wants to change their lives. He wants to set them free, amen. It's what He came to do. It's what He came to do. But unfortunately, the reality of the matter is that a lot of people will not allow Him to do that. They will choose to not allow that to happen. And because of that, they'll pay the ultimate consequence as they choose to be separated from God for all eternity. And that's the realest of situations. I'm here to tell you that I believe all of the Word of God. I believe it all to be true. I believe that the Lord, He came to save sinners. He came to set them free. He came to change their hearts and change their lives. Amen. He came to give them a new heart. He came to fill them with His Spirit. Amen. And He wants to do that, but He will only do that if they allow Him to do that. And if they do not, if you do not allow Him to do that one day, when you stare eternity in the face, if you chose not to allow the Lord to change your heart and change your life, you will be separated from Him from, for eternity. Not because that's what He wants, but because that's what you chose. He loves you today. And He wants to know you. Amen. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help 
in the time of need. Amen. I'm living in need. I'm living in need. That's what this Christianity, that's the truth of Christianity, living in need. Coming to the throne of grace on a constant basis, living in need of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, learning to depend upon Him more and more and depend upon your le yourself less and less. Amen. Living in need is where He wants you and I to be. Romans chapter 5. Like I said, I'm not going to preach too long. Some of y'all said you've been preaching too long already. Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. That word justified means being legally declared not guilty. But not only being legally declared not guilty, in God's court it means to be declared righteous. Amen. Amen. Therefore, being justified by faith, being made righteous before God. Not because you went to church. Not because you, you gave the church money. Amen. Not because you did this or you did that or you did a bunch of prayers or you got baptized in water or, or you, you spoke in tongues or you did this or you did that or any other thing. But you were justified by faith. You heard somebody tell you that Jesus came to set sinners free. You realized that you was a sinner and you needed to be set free. You believed it from your heart and confessed it with your mouth. Amen. And you became justified. Amen. You realize that can happen in a bar room. <laughs> He's a good guy. My buddy Matt over in Patterson said he was in a bathroom stall when the Lord grabbed him up by the collar. He was in a bathroom stall when the Lord really got a hold of his heart uh, in, a, in a bar room, in a bathroom, small, uh, bathroom stall. I love when he, when he tells the story, the, the stench of urine and alcohol and, and drunks everywhere. And the Lord reached down into that place and He changed His heart. Amen. He loves the drunk. Amen. He loves the drunk. He loves the lost. Amen. He wants to set them free. He's a good God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what you've got to understand, the reason that you need to have peace with God, because the Word of God says that you're at enmity with God. Do you understand that when you're born into this world, you're born into this world at enmity with God. At enmity, the word enmity literally means warring against God. You're born and everything in you is against God. Even the good stuff. Even the stuff that you think, well God must really like this about me. He don't. I'm here to tell you He don't. I'm not, I'm not being mean, but I'm just, I just got to be honest with you. I, the Bible says we're at war with God. That in our flesh there's no good thing. There's nothing good in us. Amen. Jonah read the post earlier. That Brother Curtis Hutchison put about being able to discern both good and evil. Not just discerning between good and evil, but being able to discern both good and evil. In other words, that means being able to spot the evil that's in good. Well, how can that be? If it's not of God, it ain't no good. Just because it seems good don't mean it's God. Just because it seems good, good don't always mean God. Do you understand that? But if God's in it, then it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Just because you think it's good don't mean God's in it. But if God's in it, I can guarantee you it's good. Yeah, right. Amen. When Stephen was being stoned and they bit him with their teeth, amen, when they gnashed him, the Word of God says, they stoned him and they bit him, they chewed on him. Jonah, they, they bit his flesh with their teeth and they killed him. It was good. Yes. Well, how can you say that, preacher, because God was all up in it? He was all in it throughout the ages. His prophets and his apostles, his preachers have been stoned and beheaded and killed for the glorious gospel. He loves you today. He loves you today. And if you're just lucky enough, if you're just lucky enough, maybe you'll love him enough one day to be willing to face the guillotine. To be willing to face the lion's den. If you let him have his perfect work in you, he'll make you that brave. Amen. 
He'll make you that brave if you're just lucky enough. Amen. So we've got to understand that not everything that we think is good is God. That's why we've got to let the Word of God be our light. That's why we've got to let the Word of God lead us and guide us because we're so easily deceived by what we think. We make up these opinions. Everybody's got their opinion. Well, I think God's like this. Well, who cares what you think? Why do you think that? What, what makes you think that? Just because you dreamt that last night? What's your basis for this thought that you have? Give me something to go off of. Don't just tell me because that's what you think. Because if that's just what you think, then it really doesn't make a difference to me. i got to be honest with you, and this may sound rude, I, I don't really care. That's the fact of the matter, because if it's not in the Word of God, I, I don't care what you think. I need a basis. I need, I need something for, to understand why you believe what you believe. Amen. Not, not just because I think. I mean, if that's the case, we can think that the moon is a big piece of pizza and it don't really matter. Does that even make sense? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We need some basis about what we're thinking here. And the Word of God tells us that the thoughts and the hearts and thoughts of man, they're wicked. Amen. They're, they're deceitful and they'll deceive us into going the wrong direction. Amen. Because we're at enmity. We're at war with God. We're born that way. We're born warring against the things of God. Do you understand that 99.9% .9 of what's called religion is warring against the things of God? 99.9% .9 of religion are against the things of God. The majority of people that carry Bibles in their hands are against the things of God. Do you realize that it was the religious people themselves that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? It was the church folk. Right. The church folk of the day. Right. They're the ones that say crucify. Kill it. Crucify. Because He's exposing us for what we really are. They don't like to be exposed. Religion don't like to be exposed. That's why you've got to understand to be led by two things. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. You've got to be led by those things. Well, how can I do that, preacher? Realize what the Word of God's about, who the Word of God's about, and let the Spirit of God lead you in that. Jesus made it simple for us. He made it simple. He said, the Spirit's going to come and He's going to teach you things about me. He's going to teach you things about Jesus. If the preacher ain't always teaching you about who Jesus is and what He did for you at Calvary's cross, then the chances are He missed it along the way somewhere. The chances are He missed it. If He's trying to teach you how His program's going to help you out, the chances are He missed it along the way. If he's trying to teach you that if you give him a couple thousand dollars, your bills are going to be paid, the chances are he missed it along the way. It's all about Jesus, church. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been given peace. And because we've been given peace, we're no longer enemies of God. Amen. We're no longer warring with God, but now we're friends of God. Amen. The Word of God says now we're sons and daughters of God. Amen. Before we were sons and daughters of our father, the devil. But now because we've had peace made through our Lord Jesus Christ, we're sons and daughters of God. Amen. And we can enter in boldly to the throne of grace. It's no longer a throne of judgment. Do you understand? But if you've never been through judgment, then it is. The only way to get to grace is to go through the judgment. And if you don't go through the judgment that was handed out at the cross, you'll never see the throne of grace. Oh, you'll see judgment one day. But you'll never see the throne of grace. Because it's necessary that men make peace with God. It's necessary that we make peace between ourselves and God. That we realize that we're enemies of God. Even if we don't use God's name in vain. Even if we go to church every now and then and throw a little bit of money into play. I know, man, man this preacher sounds like he don't want nobody to come to church. No, I love people to come to church. I wish everybody would be here every time the doors open because it really encourages me. But I just don't want you to be confused to think that your coming here gives you any advantage with God. It gives you no advantage. I want you to understand and know at the end of the day, the Crossway ministry 
and myself included as part of the Crossway ministry. I cannot save you or do anything for you except lead you to the one that can set you free. His name is Jesus and He wants to give you grace today. Amen. He wants to change your heart. He wants to set you free from that bondage that's controlling your life. I'm here to tell you that there's some of us today here in this place that we haven't quite got there yet, possibly, in our hearts and in our lives with realizing the things that we enjoy so much are a bondage yet. But when you come to that place that you realize that that thing that you used to take pleasure in is no longer a pleasure, but it's now a, a device that controls you. When you come to that place that you realize that, you remember what this preacher said, that Jesus Christ loves you and He wants to set you free. He loves you and He wants to set you free. And I don't care how dark the road gets and how far down that road you have to go. If there's still a breath in your lungs, amen, there's still an opportunity. If you just cry out. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Talking about the throne room of grace. Amen. Talking about entering boldly into the throne room of grace. Being able to enter openly. Not hiding anything from God. Realizing that He sees all things anyway. The greatest realization that's come in my life is just realizing that while I was yet a sinner, He died for me. He saved me when I was a failure. Do you understand that? He saved me when I was fighting against Him. He saved me when my whole life was against everything that stood for God. He saved me in the midst of that. How much more now? How much more now that I'm a son or a daughter of God do I have access into this grace now that I'm here? See, we, we oftentimes, and this is one of our biggest problems, is, is we oftentimes let our failures dictate our feelings and our emotions towards the things of God. We let our failures, well, we also let our what we think are not failures when we're doing real good. You know, you know what I experience oftentimes? I bet Ross could probably vouch for this. because I bet, I bet he's experienced. There's times in my walk with God that, man, I just feel like, man, I'm doing good. And then all of a sudden I mess up. And one, you know, Ross, one of the first things that crosses my mind is, man, I was doing so good. You ever think that? You ever feel like that? Man, I was doing so good. What happened? What happened? It's because we allow our, our, our performance, even us, people that preach the message of the cross and believe the message of the cross, we allow our performance to dictate our faith. We allow our performance to be our guiding light. Amen. And every time we start to think we're doing oh so good, the Lord stops His grace. And He leaves us running back to the throne room of grace. He leads us running back to where we found help the first time. Amen. And this is part of the process. Part of the process of learning how to depend upon the Lord. And coming to a place that when you realize that when you're doing good, it ain't really you that's doing all that good. It's grace having its way in you. It's grace having its way through you. Amen. It's grace having its perfect work. And, and as soon as you get to the place to where you think you've done something, I promise you, let me tell you what's going to happen. God's grace is going to stop and you're going to fall flat on your face. It's what's going to happen. I know. I've experienced it this week. Amen. Amen. I've experienced it this week. Today. Because we always get to, we, we always, we all, why do we do it? Why do we always, we preach this, we stand up here and we scream and we shout about not trusting in your performance and we walk away and we do it. And we fall flat on our face. But let me just encourage you in that. Because that's one thing I'm learning about the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who He is and what He did. What I'm learning about this, this gospel, amen, is that every time you fall, 
it leads you back to where you need to go. Amen. It leads you back to where you need to go. See, the, the churches that I used to be a part of and the preaching that I used to be a part of, it always led me somewhere else. When I felt the Lord, it led me to how much did I pray. It led me to how much did I read my Bible that week or how much money did I give to the church or did I do this right or did I do that right instead of leading me back to Jesus. Amen. But see, the message of the cross, the gospel message, is a message that says, hey, when you're falling on your face, get up and go back to Jesus. Don't quit. Don't run away. He saved you while you were yet a sinner. He ain't looking to kick you out now. That's right. As a matter of fact, He ain't going to kick you out. You're going to have to leave. That's right. He ain't going to kick you out. You're going to have to leave. You're going to have to leave. You're going to have to walk away. And the way that's going to happen for a Christian, the way that's going to happen, the way that they're going to walk away, is that when sin begins to take place in their heart, in their life, when they fail the Lord, instead of realizing that they've fallen and they, they've just made a mistake and they just need to go back boldly to the throne room of grace, they're going to turn to something else. And it's going, to begin to, it's going to begin to harden their heart and they're going to begin to try to hide behind fig leaves like Adam and Eve. And the next thing you know, they'll be walking out the door Oh, they might sit in church for a hundred years and never and be there every Sunday. But they might have left faith a long time ago. Do you understand that? There's going to be a lot of people that would have sat in churches for 50 and 60 years that when that trumpet sounds, they're not going to make it. Because their heart left faith a long time ago. Their heart left faith a long time ago and they've lived off of dead works and dead religion. But I'm here to encourage you today. I, I had more, but I don't feel like there's any need to go too much further. I want you to understand that God's grace is a grace that wants to change you. It wants to do a work in you. It wants to set you free. And I don't care what the bondage is. I don't, I don't care if it's drugs, alcohol, fornication, adultery, uh, stealing, lying, uh, homosexuality. I don't care what bondage it, it, it is. I don't care what it is. God's grace wants to set you free. And God's grace can set you free. And let me tell you this. I'm not telling you that when you give your heart to Jesus that you're never going to mess up again. I'm just going to break it down to you. The chances are you probably will. The chances are you'll find yourself in a situation sooner or later. Sooner or later. And, and you'll fail in the, in the sense that you'll probably commit that act maybe. But the real test is not the, the test of whether you did or didn't do something. The real test is, did you continue to fight the fight of faith? Because that's the fight. Continuing to believe. I'm not just, I'm not saying sin's okay. Sin's not okay. Sin sent Jesus to the cross. Do you understand that? Fornication is not okay. Adultery is not okay. Drugs and alcohol and, and thievery, lying and being hateful and being a gossiper. It's not okay. It's not okay. But the Lord Jesus Christ, He has grace in your time of need. He has mercy available for you today. And I want you to understand that grace is God's changing agent. He wants to change you. He wants to do a work in you. And it's going to be painful. If you walk this walk, it's going to be painful to learn how to walk this thing. It's going to be painful. Because you'll learn to come face to face with yourself on a daily basis. And if you're anything like me, you don't want to see the truth about yourself. If you're anything like me, you don't want to admit to what you really are. But this message, this gospel, it'll make you do it. But you know, some of the greatest times, and I'm closing, I promise I'm closing this time. Some of the greatest times of my life, Ross, has been times that the Lord has broken my heart. That I fell before Him and I've cried out and said, Lord, I'm so miserable. I'm such a wretch, Lord. I'm, I'm so messed up, I don't even know how you can love me. And in the Spirit, I could just feel Him put His arms around me and say, but I do. 
<laughs> Amen. But I do. There's nobody who will love you like the Lord loves you. Amen. There's nobody who will do for you what the Lord wants to do for you. He might not ever make you rich in the physical. But boy, He will bless your spirit like you never thought it could be blessed. Amen. Right. Let's stand together. I'm here to tell you today, if you don't know the Lord, if you have not been born again, if the Spirit of God has not entered into your heart, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day that He wants to save you. Today is the day that He wants to change you because tomorrow is not a promise. Amen. Tomorrow for you is just a hope. All we can do when we leave here is hope tomorrow gets here. But if it don't, make sure that you're ready. If it don't, make sure that you've asked Him to save you. Amen. Father, we just come before you tonight and we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. That through the blood of Jesus, it's no longer a throne of judgment, Lord. But it's a throne of grace where we can obtain mercy, Lord God. Father, we ask that you would touch the hearts of people in here today, Lord. If there be any that don't know you, that you would convict their hearts, that you would tug on their hearts, and you would draw them unto your Son and what He did for them at Calvary's cross, Lord God. If there are any in here that may be struggling, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen their faith, Lord. Lord, we ask tonight that you would guide us, that you would lead us, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would have your way in our hearts and in our lives, Lord. And we'll give you all the praise. And all the glory in Jesus.